Okay, oops. So I want to continue today uh, talking about spherical trig. Um, and of course, the big thing that we're building up to do is to solve the problem where to face Mecca when we pray, right? So that's obviously a really big concern to Muslims. And so it's a, it's one of the, the, the central problems of, uh, of medieval Islam to, to pray. And so, you know, we've already seen situations where math is important to religion. So for example, in the homework question this week, it's like, when is Easter? Which was like the main math problem of the middle ages, like figuring exactly when uh, Easter is. So it's doing all these kind of computations. So let's look at where we got to um, last, last week. So we're, we're studying spherical geometry trigonometry, right? And so the idea, so this was the universe that they thought of. So we think of we're on the Earth, which is a nice sphere, and it's inside the celestial sphere. And the main point to get is that this is not drawn to scale, right? The celestial sphere is so big that the Earth is really just a dot. So we know that when we're doing spherical stuff, we're doing stuff from the center of the sphere, right? That's how, what determines great circles. And we are not at the center of the Earth, right? We're actually on the Earth, but because the celestial sphere is so big in comparison to the size of the Earth, the Earth is considered just as like a dot and us being on the Earth for the point of calculations, it's the same thing as being at the, at the center of the Earth. Okay, so we know that there are important great circles. So one really important one is, you know, okay, we've got the North Pole and we've got the South Pole. So we know, uh, and we've got the equator. And this gets extended out to the celestial equator. Okay. There's another sphere between the Earth and the celestial sphere, and that's a sphere which contains the sun. Okay. Now the sun has a path which is a circle. And it's a great circle, and that is and we extend that out to the celestial sphere as well. And so this is the equator. This is the ecliptic. And we know that this angle is 23 and a half degrees. Okay. Why is it called the ecliptic? Well, it turns out. We're not done with spheres, right? We could just keep on throwing in spheres. There's a sphere for the moon. There's a sphere for Mars, Venus, Mercury, Jupiter, that's a, and Saturn. Okay, that's as far as they, they got. They had five planets, the moon and the sun inside the celestial sphere. And when these spheres actually aren't centered at the center of the earth either, right? We know that they had these deference spheres, whatever. But again, the, the, the thing is, the celestial sphere is so vast and big that all other spheres can be thought to be centered at the center. So you, even though it's an approximation, we don't lose any accuracy from that. Okay. And the reason why they were off-centered was just to explain the motion of the planets. And that. But we noticed that the, the moon, and the five planets, they also were on great circles. We're not going to bother putting them in, but they're all very close to the ecliptic. 
and we know this because you know the, we know the solar system is basically in a plane with a little bit of a tilt or whatever. And so when those great circles crossed the ecliptic, there's a chance for an eclipse. And of course, an eclipse was a big deal, um, not for any um, reasons of uh, you know agriculture, or whatever, just because probably just for astrology, really. They were thought to be significant events. So they wanted to figure out when any, whenever anything had the same coordinates as the sun, that was an eclipse, right? So that was something, particularly the moon and the, and the sun. Okay, so this, this angle here is uh, epsilon. And, and so we see that the sun itself also, so this is the north celestial pole and there's a south celestial pole as well. And there's also, a North Pole and a South Pole for the ecliptic, um, but we don't, it's not really used that much. Oh, um, I guess uh, for, for the ecliptic, we do have latitude and longitude for that. And particularly longitude, lambda is very important, right? Because, so, so what's happening? So the celestial sphere is spinning every 24 hours. And uh, the, uh, the solar sphere is rotating once a year. Okay. Um, and, and so where the sun is with lambda, that tells you what day of the year it is. So that measures the year where the sun is on the ecliptic. So we start at zero degrees is the vernal equinox. And that's Aries, that's, that's the start of Aries. And then every 30, every 30 degrees, you get a new zodiac sign. So you go Taurus, whatever the next one is, etc. And so, the, so we mark the passage of the year by the sun where it is, where its longitude is. So, so one thing that I, that I emphasized before is that angles measure everything. Angles measure angles, but they also measure distance. Uh, they also measure area. I talked about that, about how the size of a triangle, it depends upon how much angular excess there is. And the really important thing is, is um, angles measure time. So this angle here measures what day of the, uh, of the year it is. Okay. And so it gives us this, this right angled triangle, which is between the equator and the ecliptic, which is easy to figure out. Now there's one other important great circle and that depends on where you are. So here we are in Kirkville. Is that Kirkville, maybe? Uh, is that around 40 degrees north? Maybe it is. Uh, let's say it's here. Okay. And that is where you are at, directly above you, is the zenith that. There's some sort of corruption of the Arabic word for head. And down the bottom here, you've got uh, the nadir, uh, which I think just means, comes from the word for opposite, i.e. feet. In, um, oh, I, the opposite of feet, of oh, head is feet. So sapt means head. So that, so that is where you are at, and then, if we think of the zenith and the nadir as kind of like a north and south pole, then its great its equator is the horizon. So again, this is what I'm talking about with we're taking, even though we're on the surface of the, of the earth, we're taking the horizon from the center of the earth. 
Okay, and we know what this angle is. Uh, this angle gives us um, uh, the latitude, whatever whatever our latitude is. That's what that angle offset from the horizon is from the equator. And and so remember, so traveling along the ecliptic from V measures days. Traveling along the equator from the horizon measures hours. So, so you can see, hopefully you can see, you know, it's, it really is magnificent. <laughs> you know, this is why they called it the great arrangement. It kind of all works like this fantastic clock, clock piece kind of thing. So uh, I, I think you can see why the, uh, why the ancients and medieval people really, really were enamored of this thing. So, um, right. Okay. So that's that's where we're at. So let's let's. So we we. So last time we looked at the problem of solving a right triangle to figure out um, where the sun is. Okay. So the sun in in um, its coordinate system is always at lambda zero, right? Because it's on the ecliptic. And lambda is its, its uh, uh, longitude. But then we've also got alpha and delta, the right ascension and declination. That's the coordinates in the uh, equatorial system, okay? So which is kind of like the system we have on, on Earth. Like where we're using the same, so it, it corresponds to latitude and longitude on, on Earth. Okay, so that's one problem that we looked and solved. Another problem we saw was, well, okay, if this measures time, if this measures hours, then then we can we can measure how long things occur, right? Because if you know, if the sun is above the horizon. Till the time it goes below the horizon, that's the entire day, right? So you can figure out the arc length of the equator, and that's how you figure out how long the day is, right? So basically, it is going to be 180 degrees, which is going to correspond to 12 hours, right? Because 360 degrees is 24 hours, plus or minus whatever the sigma is. And this depends upon what time of year it is, i.e. it depends upon lambda. And so if the sun is at V, all this triangle gets just compressed into a dot here, and the length of the day is just from V to its opposite, the autumnal equinox, which is just 180 degrees, it's 12 hours. So at the spring equinox and at the autumn equinox, the day is 12 hours long. Okay. And then just by measuring this, this sigma, and because remember on the other side, it's going to be flipped, we just double sigma, and that's the difference from 12 hours, how long the day is going to be. And so we can answer all these kind of questions. Um, so here is, is, is a final problem that we're going to look at, and is um, when it's noon, how far is the sun from the zenith? All right. So, so that's it. That's a that's a useful thing to know, right? Because uh, we're at a spot. We know where the zenith is. It's directly above us. We can get out our astrolabe thing or whatever, and we can shoot the sun. And so, when we we when we know it's noon when the angle is going to be a particular angle. So if we know that angle, we just wait until the sun is at that angle, and then we can say, ha ha, and we can bang a gong or ring a bell or whatever and say, it's noon, yay, whatever. Okay. So, so we just set up our system here. So this is the, uh, supposed to be the celestial sphere. So remember, we're right at the center of this. 
Directly above us is the zenith. Here S is where the sun is. There's where the North Pole is. And so what happens is, so we've got this meridian, right? So this is a meridian of longitude. Remember, meridians of longitude go between north, uh, great circles that go between the North Pole and the South Pole. So we've got this, this kind of meridian here, and, we're, and it's at noon. Okay, so noon is where the sun is at, at its highest, highest spot. So, so we haven't put the uh, ecliptic in here, but the ecliptic sort of goes here, and there it's kind of like at a local maximum. That's how we know it. it's kind of noon. So at noon, it kind of lines up on the meridian. We've got, so here's, uh, we've got S, Z, and N. Um, so when it crosses the meridian, it's delta away from the equator, right? And that's, you know, just the coordinate system of the sun put into, uh, into this coordinate system. So that, that thing there is delta. Tn is 90 degrees, right? Because that's the equator and that's the North Pole. Um, and Ny, from the North Pole to the horizon, that's just the latitude B. So we can see that um, Sz, which is what we want to figure out how far the sun is from the zenith, is going to be nt minus st minus nz. Okay, um, nt is 90, uh, st is delta, and nz is 90 minus uh, phi, right, because Zenith to the horizon, that's 90 degrees. Okay, and so it just turns out to be phi minus uh, delta. Okay, so for your so for your latitude, all you need is a table of deltas, right? So you need a table of every every day of the year, what is it's going? What what it what is its alpha and, and delta? And that was exactly what we first problem we figured out. Okay, so if alpha is greater than delta, then this is uh, positive, and that means the sun is in the south, and then shadows point north. Okay, so you all know that when it's noon, you look at the shadow and. Has anyone ever done that while hiking? When phi equals delta, that means the sun is directly overhead. So that means the, the, the zenith actually happens at noon. Okay. Um, now, uh, so the northernmost point where this can happen is when lambda equals 90 degrees, right? Because when lambda equals 90 degrees, it's uh, like a, a, a quarter circle away from the vernal equinox. So it's at the, the summer solstice, and that's where there's the... Um, and 90 degrees is cancer, is the, is the uh, sign of cancer. And so this is the Tropic of Cancer, so trop, from Tropos Greek for turning. So it's when, so you kind of think about it, the ecliptic, it's sort of going there, it's reached its height and now it's sort of going down, so it's turning. And likewise, the southernmost point is at land that equals 270 degrees and that's Capricorn, and that's where you get the Tropic of Cancer. So if you really want to know why those things are, that's that. Okay. So let's have a look at the Islamic contribution. Uh, so there are three astronomers who really kind of 
went to town on spherical uh, trigonometry. And um, this is all part of kind of like the development of trigonometry. So spherical trigonometry was occurring, was developing at the same time as plane trigonometry. And so we see this is all kind of like the golden age of Baghdad and there's a house of wisdom there. And, and uh, the caliph was commissioning all these uh, things to do with science. So the one that we're gonna look at is Abu al-Wafa who, who wrote his Zij al-Majisti. So that's an almagist. So like from Ptolemy's work. And remember Zij just means like a book of trig tables. So it's like explaining how to make various tables. Okay. So, um, so the first thing that, so actually um, quite a few of these, I think all, uh, no, uh, I think the last two, Abu Wafa and Abu Nasser, both came up with the rule of four quantities. We're just seeing how it was done in Abu Wafa's case. Okay, so this is known as the rule of four quantities. So that diagram there explains how it's, it's uh, proved, but let me kind of just do another picture. Uh, so we've got two right triangles, one within each the other, and they have this common acute angle here. Okay, and, it, and it's show, saying that there's a relationship between, uh, oh, I, I switched it around, didn't I? Okay, sorry. D, B, A, this is G, and this is B. And the rule of, uh, of uh, four quantities says that the sine of B, G, all right, so this over GA equals the sine of DE over the sine of EA. Okay, so which plane trig theorem is this like? So if we were just talking about normal plane triangles, what is this theorem the same as? Nope, not law of signs. So what, so if I had a situation like this, what is the relationship between um, D, triangle DEA and triangle GBA. They're, they're similar triangles, right? Or whatever you would call that. Okay, so in plain trig, these would be similar triangles. And what's the relationship we get from similar triangles? Proportional sides, Proportional sides right? We would get. BG over GA equals DE over EA. So this is the theorem in normal trig. This is the theorem in spherical trig. So as I, as I said before, it's the same identities except they get, make, get triggified. You know, they, there's a trig in, in front of them. So the rule of four quantities is really just saying something about these similar triangles, except it's nonsense to talk about similar triangles for spherical triangles, because as I said, um, for example, even though this angle equals this angle, and this angle is the same for this, these two angles 
are going to be different. So they're not similar triangles in the sphere. They're kind of like spherical triangles. Okay, and I put the proof in there just because to give you an example of what a spherical trig proof looks like. Basically, all other spherical trig um, proofs are, are very similar to this. It's something that you prove about plane triangles and then you project it onto the, onto the sphere. And so what happens here, if, if you can see this, this it's, it's kind of hard to see, but here's the spherical triangle. And um, since the sides are great circles which go through the center, you kind of just project onto those planes. And uh, you, you, look, you, you find these two planar triangles, which are similar. And so since they're similar, you can take um, the, 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 you can use the, the, the result for similar triangles where the ratio of sides, of, how do you put it, Blake? You put it really well. Yeah, the proportional sides, exactly. So you've got proportional sides from these triangles that you generate, but then you look at what these things mean, and you see since they're inside circles, they're the sides of right triangles inside circles, you can interpret them as signs. And so that's how the, that proof follows. I'm not going to ask you to prove anything in spherical trigonometry. I just wanted you to have a, a, a reason, a, an idea of why, why things always get added to trig function. It's because when you take it from the sphere into the plane, you end up with sides, and those sides then can be interpreted as, as sines or cosines, because remember, they are all lengths uh, in this world. And of course, We've got the law of signs. Now we need a law of signs, right? Because all the triangles we were solving before were right triangles. Okay, so we need a way of solving non right triangles. And we know the way to do that is the law of signs. And so this is, and so remember Abu al Wafa prove the normal law of signs. And if you remember what that proof looks like, you see that this looks exactly the same picture as before, if you can remember that far back. Okay, so the law of signs um, in normal plane trigonometry is at little a divided by sine of big A, little b divided by sine of big B. But of course, since everything gets put in a trig function, you can take signs of those. Okay, and the proof is actually pretty simple. So here we take our ABC triangle. Uh, we drop down a perpendicular to AB, and then we extend all the sides of the triangle so that they, they are quadrants, right? So they are 90 degrees on the great circle. And if you do that, that turns A and B into poles for opposite equations. Okay, and then you just use the, uh, the rule of four quantities on those two situations, right? And, um, and things simplify, right, because, because it's a pole, a lot of the arcs are 90 degrees, so that just turns out to be one. We've got sine of DC, but we're not going to do anything with that. But the important thing is um, this arc TH here, since this is a quadrant of a circle, this arc length here is exactly this angle B. And this arc length here is exactly that angle A, because we've done it out to the full 90 degrees. And so then if you just cross multiply 
you can get uh, sine dc equals sine of big A times sine of little b, and sine dc equals sine of big A, bits, sine of big b times sine of little a, and that's exactly this bit here. And then you can do the same thing for, for C. So that turns out pretty good. Okay, so with this, we, get, we can basically solve any spherical triangle. So remember we had those four theorems from Tuesday, and we've got the sine law. And with those five theorems, you can basically solve any uh, spherical triangle. So I'm gonna stop here, and then I'm gonna pick up next week, we're gonna solve the problem of given any two points on earth, what direction do you go in the great circle to go from one to the other? I, so this is like gonna be used for Muslims to know which direction Mecca is so you can pray. Jews can figure out where Jerusalem is so they can figure out where they can pray, etc. So you can figure out, or if you're flying a plane from Kirksville to New York, you can figure out which direction it is so you can just go to the straightest line. Okay, that's it for today. Uh.